Hi, Pierre. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. I look forward to it. So like I do with most guests, I thought we'd start by perhaps if you could do a little intro about who you are, what is Vision 54, and a little background to you and your work. Yeah, so, so Vision 54 is uh, the company that myself and Lynn Marriott that we, we run and we coach we coach golfers. We coach a lot of competitive professional golfers and we run golf schools for the, what we call the real golfers. <laughs> we do coach training. But um, anyways, the, the 54 actually came back from way back when I used to be head coach in, in Sweden and it stands for 18 birdies. <laughs> and uh, it was back then to just change the mindset of the golfers from having excuses to actually look at what's possible. And that mindset has stayed with Lynn and myself for all golfers. It's like, what are the possibilities we all have and how can we train to access more of those? I love that you believe that a golfer one day will shoot uh, 54 and you believe that is possible. And then even calling your company name yeah. Vision 54, I think is amazing. Well, it, you know, it's, you know, and with with the, the elite players, you know, many of them on their home courses have made a birdie on each one of the holes. So they can still imagine themselves doing it and, and you know even st started talking this way and you know Annika Sternstab kept that in the back of her mind her entire career so it doesn't mean you're disappointed not shooting 54 but you still believe it's possible and there are many of the professional golfers that are starting to shoot 26 27 for for nine holes and so it's very interesting and <laughs> Lynette I've been fortunate you know coached two players to 59 of course, Annika, but then also Russell Knox. I knew you were behind Annika Soroston and really helped her game to take it to the next level, but I didn't realise you were behind Russell Knox as well. So that's two 59s you've had in your coaching accolade. Well, you know, the, the 59 was a few years ago. He was still on, on the web.com or what used to be called the web.com uh, web tour. So a couple of years ago. <laughs> if I recall when Annika Soroston achieved her 59. Didn't she birdie eight of the first nine holes? Yes, the first eight, actually. Well, it's interesting. I, I've, I was fortunate to be there at Moon Valley. It was the LPJ tournament here in Phoenix, Arizona. But it's so interesting. Because the first thing she said coming off the green after the 59, and she had a putt for 58, but she said, P, I know it's even more possible now. Because she knew after starting with eight birdies, she started thinking like, this is scary good. <laughs> and she knows she kind of stopped the flow because it felt too good to be true to start with eight birdies. So she knew she, 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 she got, she's the one who got herself in the way. And then she got back to her, the mindset for the day and just treat each shot the same. And she may start making a few more birdies. So it's pretty interesting. Why does that happen when we get in the way of ourselves? Well, you know, our mind is so funny, you know, sometimes, you know, your mind can be in the past and the present and the future, but sometimes when we start predicting the future, we feel like how, you start thinking, how am I doing this? And then you start being cognitive about it and you lose the flow because <laughs> that, that peak performance state is, it's not a cognitive state. So when you start thinking about how good I'm doing, it's so easy to lose it. What I find with my own game is that I jump from being in the past and then jumping into the future. So in the past, I think what could have been, what shots I've missed, where I could have perhaps picked up shots, where I let them go to the course. And then sometimes when I'm walking down the fairway in between shots, I would jump into the future thinking I need to birdie yeah. the next hole or I've got a tough drive coming up. I need to make sure I hit this one in the fairway. During those moments when the mind flickers from past to future, uh, what is the best thing a golfer can do to remain present and in that Zen state of mind? Oh, but that's what's the interesting thing and where our game is so important because it becomes a fundamental skill that we actually can more be in charge of our attention. Because when you think about it, every shot you hit, when you prepare for your shot, we call it the think box, but then you're in the future, you know, I'm going to hit the shot, it's 150 yards, wind right to the left, you're planning for the future. So every preparation, every pre-shot routine is, you need to be in the future. But since golf is not a reactionary sport, you need to learn to 
be done with that and then step in to be present for every golf shot. It might be feeling your grip pressure, it might be seeing the ball flight, it might be sensing tempo, but you know, you go to something sensory to stay present like you do in all peak performances. And then after the golf ball goes somewhere, all of us have to manage the past. <laughs> so every shot has the three time frames. And uh, it's 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 a it takes just training to learn to now it's good to plan for the future and now it's good to reflect on the past and now I need to be darn good at stepping into the present. So most golfers just haven't trained it enough. And you call that method the think box? Well, the think box is preparation for the shot in, in our how we talk about it. And then play box is the time and space when you actually make a swing or stroke. And then how you react to a golf shot, we call it the memory box. I wonder if we could just touch on these, as I think they'll be really interesting for the listeners. When should a golfer implement these during a round of golf? For, for, for every shot you hit for the rest of your life. <laughs> the think box, for example, would that start when you walk up to the ball and you set the habit with a cue, for example, your bag hitting the ground? Uh, would yeah. that start the think box routine? Yeah, that, I mean that, and that becomes a little individually different for for many players. But you know, in the t- today's world, we we need to help so many just actually simplify what they do before the shot. But it is usually when you come up to the shot and start checking the yardage and the wind, and you know, doing what's essential to make a clear decision, but not more than that. So the think box, you'd be thinking very future tense. Yeah, it's, it, it, exactly. You know, what is the wind doing? What do I want the ball to do? And and make a decision about what you're going to do. It must take a lot of time to develop the skill from going uh, future-based, say, in the think box to very present mindset when you're in the play box, when you're standing over the ball. Jumping back and forth is a skill that must be learned over time. Yeah, Actually, we, we, we found it isn't that that difficult but it is difficult if you've never trained it and that's why we even give golfer we put down a decision line we usually put down a blue line like okay you're not allowed to step over that line till you know you're done making up your mind and now you're going to step into being an athlete so it's but it's a very 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 essential skill for playing good golf to learn to do it and not step into the shot still being undecided what you're going to do and still thinking about what you're going to do and it's way too late. I can safely speak on behalf of every golfer who's listening out there that we've all stood over a golf ball with second doubts or a change in mind. We don't feel comfortable when we're about to hit a golf shot. I guess the best thing to do during these moments is to stand back away from the ball. Yes, you should step step back definitely because many know when we go ahead and hit that putt or hit that shot, it usually doesn't end, end up very good. So you need to step back but also realize, you know, I need to practice this skill a lot more so I don't have to back off so often on the course. <laughs> I think that in itself is a real skill to to learn and develop within your game of standing over a golf shot and not feeling comfortable but then having the power to to step back away from it and start again. I almost feel it's like going into the fridge, having a spoonful of uh, ice cream and then someone saying to you, stop right there, you can't have any more. I think learning the ability to step away from a golf shot takes a lot of discipline and is definitely a skill which needs to be learned and practised. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and, and you know, what Lynn and I get so excited about because there's so much we know now about performance science and neuroscience and all of that so there end up actually being two sets of fundamentals we're always going to have our technical fundamentals we need to deal with but then you have these other fundamentals you need to play the game of golf and it's actually to have how to manage yourself out there and we just think any golfer should learn that along with developing their technique so you can function on a golf course so what should the state of mind be in the play box? Should it be very calm and quiet? Well, that, this what, what we do know is like, if you simplify can think about, your mind can be thinking, being logical and all of that, that you need to be before the shot. But then 
if you're not thinking, you can be more sensory, meaning I can feel the grip pressure. I can see a ball flight. I can experience the tempo I want. So it's, it's, you're not thinking anymore. You're actually sensing. You're actually like, you know, you're not talking about what you're doing. You're feeling or seeing something. And that's what all people do in peak performance. So in the play box, you, we want you to know. And what that is, is different for different players. So we always want them to check some more seeing the ball fly, seeing the target things, some more sensing grip pressure or shoulder tension or tempo and just explore different things. I know if I go to that, I become an athlete and I'm just sensing something towards the target. And when we stay there, then sometimes during the round or some days we step into just being, we're just totally in the flow. It's like I just step up and I do it. And, you know, when those days happen or the the holes we experience that happens, we just say thank you because it's beautiful. I couldn't agree more. And the last stage of these three? Yes, the, the memory box, and it, we, we think is one of the most, you know, unused, rea- you know, realizations of the game. Because as, as humans, anything that we we do in golf and anything outside of golf that there is a, an emotion attached to, the brain store stronger as a memory. So, you know, that's why a child put in the hand on a hot stove and they start crying, you know, because it hurts, but the good news is next time they get close to a hot stove, they're going to back off because the brain stores it as a memory. So we all have that function. But many golfers, we found out, that don't know this. They hit so many good shots and they stay just objective. Like, oh, that was good, and put the club back in the bag. So they're totally like neutral, objective. And then when they hit, you know, anything on the toe or maybe it's not the ball flight they want, they go like, oh, darn it, I didn't want to do that. And the emotion lies anything that isn't perfect. But what it means is that the brain picks up as memory much stronger our bad shots and it is like Teflon on all our good shots. So you could be a golfer that developed technically, but they never feel confident going into golf shots. But it's all based on how they have managed their reaction after a shot so it, it's massively important what sort of drills can a golfer do to increase the memory with associations of great shots yeah you know so the the there's what we need to do is simple but it still need to be trained is when when you stick your finish if you like what happened is just do something that makes a positive feeling inside of you. So you can just smile inwardly. You know, some are more extroverted and like to do a fist pump or whatever. You don't have to do it, but you need to do something where there's a little emotion to it while you put your club back in the bag. So the brain associates that good shot with with what just happened. And then, of course, we can hit many shots we don't like on the golf course. And then it's just a matter of being more objective. Like, oh, I pulled it in the left bunker and you know, next time I'm going to swing at a different tempo. Or just being factual, objective. Then I can draw the learning, but I don't get the baggage of storing bad memories. Interesting. So you're actually conditioning almost the neural pathways to be hooked on hitting great shots. Yeah, and if, if, you know, being a good golfer, we kind of need that because that decides when I have similar shots in the future, I can get that go signal like, wow, this is, I can do it. I've done this before. I really like how you've broken that part of the game down into three stages. I think the listeners will really be able to take a actionable approach to these elements within the game because you've defined them and deconstructed them so well. So thank you for that. Uh, Moving on, in your book, you said that to be a great coach of your own game, you have to be self-aware. I was wondering if we could touch on that and what you meant by that. Yeah, and it actually comes from some of the Olympic research, what the you know, top performers do that have sustainable success, and but we feel it applies to like every golfer. So self-aware is just that I'm actually aware of what I'm doing. Like I can, I'm aware of what 100% tempo swing is compared to 50% tempo swing. <laughs> like I'm actually aware of the 
what is happening right now. Or I can be aware of if I've stayed focused till the end of the swing, that I actually have that ability to, to ex- you know, I know what I'm doing and my coach doesn't need to tell me, like I can actually feel it myself. So we just feel many need to practice a lot more to be self-aware, to, to know what we're doing. So even a newer golfer need to have some kind of self-awareness, like did I actually stay with that grip pressure to the end of the swing or not? And self-referencing is that you always want to compare yourself to yourself. So meaning, I want to be the best P I can be. I can't be like, oh, I wish I was like Chris, because I'm not you. <laughs> so it's in, in today's world with all the, the social media and social comparison, it's become even better. Like, I can't play golf like other people, but I can play my best golf in my unique way. So we want golfers more and more, you know, instead of saying, I wish I hit it as far as, you know, area Utanagan, or I wish I started golf earlier. No, no, no. You need to reference yourself and be the best you can be. Because I often say, if there's 7 billion golfers on the planet, there's not, but let's say everybody play golf. There's 7 billion ways of doing it. So you need to do the self-referencing. And and the uh, self-regulating is that I can actually regulate myself while I play. When I play, and I, I can actually notice, you know what? I'm getting nervous and my adrenaline is so high, I need to drop down my tempo to swing well. That I can actually regulate and do things when things happen when I'm playing. I really connect with the self-referencing element and... I think if you look at a player like Phil Mickelson, for example, and the way he has approached the game in his own unique way and style, it seems that every great player has connected to themselves and they have their own and very unique way of playing the game, whether it be Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Sergio Garcia, Nick Faldo. They've all very much got in tune with themselves and played the game the way they see it rather than mimicking others. Exactly. I mean, all the great players, when you look at all the greatest players through the history of times, the thing they have in common is that they're so different. (laughs) You know, know, Jack Nicklaus is very different from a Greg Norman or Greg Norman is really different from a Tiger Woods and on the women's side, Kathy Whitworth is totally different from a Joanne Carner to an Annika Sörenstam to, an, you know, it just goes on and on that the greatest players found their unique way of doing it. And that should hold true for all I of think us. social media has a big part to play with this and being online. We like to mimic traits and personalities of the people yeah. who we respect or who are influencers instead of really taking a big dive yeah. deep within, thinking about who we are and yeah. what we like. Yeah, and no, it's super, and it's super okay to, you know, you might be curious. I want to check out that for myself. But then knowing if it doesn't fit you, just delete it. <laughs> this is a question from one of the listeners. And they want to know when having a technical lesson or highly analytical lesson with a coach perhaps working on swing mechanics or positions what is the best way to then go back to playing golf in a competitive like scenario perhaps when you may not have as much control over the ball but you know you have to go out and just play golf and play the game yeah you know and this is so real it happens but first is you know when you realize like okay i've got really good lesson now and I have all these things to work on but i'm going to go and play golf now so you need to say is there anything from what i learned that i can create a feel of that i can use in my play box so you need to have the ability okay is there but some can't do that so we found out one of the best things to do if you just have a few minutes before playing, is to make sure you get into a more athletic state in your body. So so if you hit a few shots doing some balance, some tempo, some tension awareness to get away from thinking and just get into the feel, it can be easier to transition. So it could be just hitting a few shots, you know, with the feet together and finishing balance or hitting a few shots on only one foot and finishing balance. When you do that you stop thinking so much because you can't sense balance if you're thinking too much, you know? 
and then hitting a, a couple of shots with slower, medium, and faster tempos, and a couple of shots with, you know, being really tight, being medium, medium taut, and then some supple, relaxed shoulders, just getting your body away from thinking about details of the swing to just a whole athletic feel. And then, then you just need to be so decisive before you go and play. You know, you might know in the back of your mind, okay, I have things to work on my swing, but those things are never allowed out on the golf course. So today I'm going to stay with my 75% temper to the finish, or today I'm going to just totally see my ball flight in blue color and searing on the flag, and that's what I'm going to do today. So you need to be really disciplined to have a focused playing so you don't bring your swing lesson with you on the golf course. So really exaggerating all of those kinesthetic feelings and sensations and really sort of leaving everything technical on the range. Well, not so for everybody. It's, it's going to be somewhere on the sensory spectrum, but some players really like to you know, visualize. Some don't. Some like, I just need to stay with that light grip pressure to the finish, and that's best for me. So we've learned like we can't – there is, isn't a preset way of doing it, but it doesn't take long to figure out with self-reference what is best for you. But it's going to be something that is on the sensory spectrum. So you get athletic and you get in a performance state. Amazing. Thank you so much for all of those valuable insights. There's lots to jot down on a pen and paper with that one. Uh, moving on, how, how did your book, Be a Player, come to be? Yes. Well, it's our fourth book that Lynn Merritt and myself have written. And, and uh, after a third book, it took a few years before we, we wrote this one. But we, we just, the more we coach elite players and the more we did our golf schools we just realized like it we need to move training and exploring to the golf course and and because like in any sport you always you know in swimming you go to a swimming pool and tennis you go to a tennis court and you know football you're on a football field you're you train in the context of play and in the you know area that you actually play the game but so many golfers when they they only practice on the range and the putting green and then they expect it to transfer to the golf course right away they get very very disappointed so we just realized and it doesn't you know it doesn't take longer you're only still playing with one ball and you you can do it while you play with your any three some four some you're playing with but you you bring in some exercises to do and explore on the golf course where it Whereas our field of place, our swimming pool is our basketball court. And that's the only place you can actually figure out what works for you or not works, doesn't work for you. So the B player is all about how can I learn these non-technical golf fundamentals? And, and I can learn them on the golf course and anyone can do it. I'm very grateful for your book. It was one of the, the few books that I used to keep on my college dorm room in America was playing collegiate golf in North Carolina and really was considering turning pro and really wanted to know and understand why I was playing the game, uh, what it meant to me. And I used to revisit your book frequently and it's filled with lots of underlines and highlights. So I want to thank you so much because it had a huge impact on me and my game and the decisions I made when I was on the golf course. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. That's really fun to hear. And we know we've heard so many stories from all level golfers and it makes us very, very happy. I wanted to ask you some of the golfers you work with in the past and currently work with, what are some of the principles that some of the very best golfers who take their game to the next level, in particular with work ethic in mind? Yeah, but you know, one of the things we always start with, we just call it the My 54, it would be the Chris 54 or Pia 54, but what do we mean by that? You need to be really clear about what you do when you play well. And any player coming to us, we were first asking, what are the things you do when you play well? And most golfers have a very hard time answering that. They might say like, I make putts and my drives are in the fairway, like, and like, of course, <laughs> of course that happens. But what is it beyond that? Is it that when your temper feels smooth? Is it when the weather is nice? Is it when, 
you know, you play with people that you like? Is it when, what is it? What, what are the things, what are the ingredients for you that seem to be there when you play well? So most golfers haven't thought about that. So we ask them first, like, just start a habit of writing down after rounds the holes you played well, just the things you notice how it is for you. And then, you know, over a few weeks or a couple of months' time, you actually have your recipe of things you seem to do when you play well. Because we said about that earlier that everybody has a unique way to play in great golf, but we need to help the player more efficiently figure that out. And then, of course, to the most common ways how we mess up and get in our own way. And when I say these two, how, what you do when you play well and how you mess up, it's, of course, be technical things, but you need to get to all these non-technical things. And with any golfer that comes, we need to help them first figure out what works best for them in the play box. And then the think box and memory box need to, like, match up with that. And then what you do all the time between shots. So, so it becomes like... There are only four areas of the golf course you need to figure out what you do before, during, after the shot, and then between shots. So those are the things we want the player to get clarity on and um, and so they can have a game plan for themselves. Say if someone is super creative and, say, has never had a lesson in their life, such as like a Bubba Watson-like character, and then you've got another golfer who's extremely technical, should the creative golfer implement some philosophies and ideas uh, around technical elements of the game and vice versa. So basically one is not missing out on the other. Absolutely. Because, you know, just being good on all the, the human golf fundamentals and you don't know how to hit a high or low shot, or you don't need to chip, it's not going to work. And, and, and vice versa, if I can hit all these ball flights I can hit all these shots around the green but I can't manage myself I'm going to underperform so it's not either or for us it's both but you know the answer to your question is first depends on <clears throat> the goal of the that golfer in, in you have in mind because that's why we ask like you know how good of a golfer do you want to be and how much do you practice and how much do you play because there are many that that for example wants to lower the handicap a lot but then Reality is they don't have much time to practice. So then you have to ask, like, the swing changes that could be done, is there any <clears throat> time to make those swing changes? <laughs> so if there isn't any time to make those swing changes, then you need to be careful going down that route. And once again, all the swing changes are meant to be left on the range or when working with a coach. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Or, or, you know, many of the things you can do work at, at home in front of the mirror or the range. And then when you go on the course, like some some bring some, you know, technical fields with them on the golf course. And that could be all fine. Some can't do it because they start thinking too much. But for some, it's really important to to bring it with them. But they know they're not trying to improve their technique while swinging. They're not like having all these to-do lists. They just know, you know, the things I'm doing, I just want to feel more stability in my lower body to the finish or, you know, something like that. I want to be respectful of your time, Piers. So uh, I thought we'd move on to the sort of rapid fire questions and start with what is one of your recommended books or one of the couple of books that you've recommended or gifted the most that have greatly impacted and affected your life in a positive way it can be on or outside of the golf course yeah no, I, I think one of the things we're giving out the most is especially we do a lot of coach training is called mastery by by george leonard and we just love it because it's based on a lot of you know science how mastery happens but that there is never a straight line to success. We all go through plateaus and slumps, and then we have peaks of greatness. But it's it's a very small, simple book that it's just been nice to give to to a lot of people just to you know not think something is wrong because score doesn't go down the same way month after month after month. <laughs> it's a squeak, squeaky line to getting better. How interesting! I actually have that book on my bedside table I have yet to get round to reading it it's been there for uh, about over six months so I will dive into that one for sure thank you very much uh, moving on to the next one what uh, aid or item has 
greatly impacted your life uh, that was sort of under a hundred dollars in the last six to twelve months? Well, you know, actually, I mean, I would, I would say, um, you know, actually for me it was just I bought some some yoga blocks because I need to do more yoga to be, be a little more flexible. But that's been enormously helpful for me to be able to to do do a lot of things. Um, like that and, and I would say another thing and you know, I, I like to meditate a lot and and um, anyways I mean, I, some of the apps out today are so outstandingly good there's one called Calm for example and I just yeah. realized it's it's not a big purchase but it has tools that you can use for the rest of your life amazing I was very fortunate enough to, to work in the same company as Alex Chu the founder of Calm when I used to live in San Francisco. So um, I, Calm's a fantastic app and is mentioned a lot on this golf podcast. And the other one I like is Headspace. So I recommend them to both listeners to sort of take a take you up on the free trial on both. You can download them on your iPhone or Samsungs. Uh, they are available to everyone. Oh, they're actually creating a golf version now that's, that's called Imagine Golf that's kind oh, of starting. Amazing. Uh, you and yeah. Lynn going to do that from Vision Fifty Four? No, no. The 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 founders of Calm are supporting this new app, and we, it's just a beta version. But they they asked us to be be a little part of it, so we have one session in there. <laughs> oh, amazing! So I'll we'll have to look out for that, and I'll put it in the show notes. So it's Imagine Golf. Uh, Imagine Golf. Yeah, yeah. It's already out. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's already started in the early stages. Okay, so what? new behavior or habit in the last five years has greatly impacted your life again this could be on or off the golf course yeah but i um i would say no the the habit that i've always had and lynn has the same too that just staying staying very curious and want to keep on learning not thinking we've already got it you know so it's to and to stay learning and, and being being curious, I think, is the greatest of all habits. And, and just to reflect more often on what is actually most important. Because I think for for me and for Lynn or for you know, all of us, sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. There's so much to do or so much you could do or should do or whatever. So just more often of all the possibilities, what is actually most essential of course, you know, for me in my life, but also in my, my coaching. And I just feel that having having that habit to ask that more often is is becomes the last few years has become even more important. And we've learned a lot about you know the attention span in general for people has just been cut in half because of all the overload of stimuli we all get. So I think we need in my experience some more habits like that in today than we needed maybe 10 or 20 years ago. How do you cultivate or find time for that? Well, it, I, I just do it because without it, the daily life doesn't become as good, you know, and it doesn't, doesn't take many minutes just to sit down and reflect on, for example, what is the, of all the things today on the list, what is absolutely most important of all of them? And kind of just a, as a basic question to have and, check in with and make sure you get time for those most important things, which is probably doesn't include scrolling on social media or something like that. <laughs> Do you journal or use your phone or carry around a notebook? Yes, yes. No, Lynn is really big on, on journal and she has a gratefulness journal and I know it's one of her habits she likes to do daily to check in on that. And um, I, I journal in actually she has a, it, there's a journal really good it's called the, it's the five minute journal and it's really really simple to fill in and I know she loves that you know for, for me it's more so they have, I've meditated for very many years and it's just to you know for me to make sure I get that time and that's been the very most important thing and do you meditate in the morning or in the evening both <laughs> my, my I, I do best when I get, you know, both in the morning and then late afternoon. Sometimes it's not doable, but, uh, you know, most days it is. I remember someone saying to me a while ago that if I didn't have 10 minutes to sit down and meditate, that I didn't have my priorities straight. 
uh, which looking back on it, yeah. it makes total sense that, um, you know, if I couldn't sit down and yeah. just settle the mind and quiet the mind for 10 minutes a day, then uh, I probably didn't have my priority straight and, and was uh, prioritizing things that were far less important as more important. Yeah, no, I, I would say that and just from what we just talked about this, even if you can just find one minute a day just to sit down and at least, you know, feel your breath for a minute or sit down and feel your feet for a minute, but just make sure you get to get in the habit of, of uh, you know, being more sensory being and not just thinking so much. I, I think it's in, in today's um, life, I think many of us need to do it. And I, I feel with, for example, meditating, many say, well, I can't do that. I don't have 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes. But then say, well, start with a minute then, <laughs> you know. It's these tiny, small habits when we can build on those that can make the magic happen. And, you know, yeah. and I, you know, I know when, when Lynn, she saw this question too, and for her it's absolutely to feel feel that gratitude in her heart for a minute every day that it becomes the most essential thing as a action challenge i think that's a lovely way to wrap this episode up to a conclusion and thank you so much for all of the wonderful insights you've shared with us today there are so many gems and actual goodies for all us golfing listeners and diehard fans to take advantage of and take our game to the next level and implement some of your actions and routines where can people find you on the online world and stay up to date with all your progress? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. So the, our website is vision54.com and we actually the last couple of years now spend so much more time because some people come and see us in person, but it's not doable for many. So we have, of course, we have a Vision 54 app and we have other digital pro- pro- products, but we also have these other more remote trainings where you still can get feedback and communicate with us. So we many think like, oh, I can't come and coach, get coaching because you're in Arizona and I'm in you know England or Australia or whatever, but it's not true anymore. So we're really excited about that. But all the information is on our website, vision54.com. And if you search for that on the social media options, you'll find us there as well. Okay, so... Last question. I know you have a personal action challenge that is prepared for our listeners. This is something which you deeply believe in that has greatly <laughs> impacted or affected yeah. your life, and whether it be on or off the golf course. So please fire away. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and, and thank you f- for this. And you know, it's it's really fun to do this podcast too when the host, like you, are so well prepared and there are really good questions, and that that means a lot to us. And and we're so excited about the possibilities for all us golfers in the future because when we realize that there are two fundamentals of golf: the technical and the non-technical, mm-hmm. so many more can enjoy the game more and play better. So we're, it's a fun thing coming uh, that we realize that now. Thank you so much again for your time to, today, Pia. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on and hopefully get a round two in with Lynn in as well at some point. Uh, it be a pleasure to have you both on. Um, we wish you all the very best for the future. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much, Chris. Mm-hmm.